it's an unspoken code, right? I mean, it's, yeah. Yeah, whether you're a veteran or as a physician, like th that that oath you take, mm. whether it's to the country or, to, you know, the Hippocratic Oath, it it's something that you really have to uphold daily. Yeah. And people take it for granted. And they're certain, look, there are bad people in every, in every sure, profession. Yeah. But I'll tell you, the last two and a half years have, has really like eroded the trust between the doctor and the patient. Let's go. Welcome to Citizen. We got a very special guest today, uh, Doctor Scott Farber, military veteran. Uh, what, what's what actually? So tell me, run me through your uh, military career and then how you got into medicine after. Sure. So I, I had a little bit of a backwards way. So typically, most people would go into the military and then you know then eventually go into medicine. I mm. kind of did it backwards. I did medicine first mm. and then military. So. But in retrospect, uh, the military, or Uncle Sam, did pay for medical school. Mm -hmm. So it was, you know, wasn't the reason why I did that, but uh, it certainly helped with, uh, you know, with the loans <clears throat> and stuff. So, so you got, uh, you went to, where did you go to pre-med? So I did undergrad in Boston, mm -hmm. uh, a small school mm -hmm. called Brandeis outside of Boston. Okay. And then I went back to New York City for medical school, mm -hmm. spent four years there. In St. Louis for eight years for residency, Oof. Uh, and then uh, back to New York for one year in fellowship, which I specialize in craniofacial mm -hmm. like reconstruction, <clears throat> with the intent of uh, doing that, you know, for the military, and right. then um, and then uh, down to San Antonio. But uh, yeah, and my time spent in the military was at Walter Reed. Okay. Uh, doing, you know, craniofacial reconstruction. So you were in D.C. the whole time you were in, well, well like six years? How long was no, you? No, no, I've been a reservist the whole time. So mm. just, uh, you know, doing my time my time each year. Mm, I uh, see. And then, uh, you know, occasionally I would go up there for extended time to help out. So. Are you still in now? I have f four more months in IRR and then I'm done. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, so how does that work for a, a physician in IRR? Can you, I mean, it, I, it seems like you're more likely to get called up than an infantry guy. It just depends on the situation. Mm. So um, I just went IRR a couple months ago. Mm. Uh, you might, I got deployed, if you would call it a deployment, I got deployed to New York City during the COVID mm. when, on the comfort, when that whole thing, when COVID first started. So you were, um, were you out on a boat or some shit? They, didn't the they? comfort. Yeah, yeah. And then, yeah, and then they also put us in ICUs in mm. New York City. I so, see. Mm -hmm. That's cool. I mean, it sucked. But uh, so uh, you, were, what, you were going in as a major or how does that work? Uh, depends on you know when you enter. So mm -hmm. if you enter after medical school, you're going in as a lieutenant. Mm -hmm. So O three right for for the Navy. Uh, I was Navy, so just oh yeah, yeah. Again, Navy. So, yeah, I, don't, so I don't really 03. even know the ranks. Um, but if you're going in during medical school, you go in as an ensign. In 01. Yeah. It, wait, I'm sorry. If you go in after, so like if you graduate college, uh, yeah. or, you know if you and you decide to join, there's different pathways. So mm -hmm. you, you can do it when you're in college you can join when you're in college and mm -hmm. there's a program called hpsp yeah, yeah. which pays for medical school right off the bat but then you owe them four years active duty mm -hmm. uh and everything is covered but then you know you in college you become an 01 you have to go to what they call a knife and fork school which is you go to newport for six mm -hmm. weeks and do you know learn the basics of saluting and wearing mm -hmm. the uniform and that sort of thing for six weeks uh so same thing for me um but I did it kind of retro, you know, retrospectively or retroactively where I already went through medical school. Mm. I already was in my residency uh, and then then did it. But, so you were in your residency yeah. when you joined? Right. The, so I considered doing that when I was mm. in medical school. The only issue is that, as you know, with the military, they potentially could tell you, OK, you're going to be going here or you're going to be doing this. And right, I wanted yeah, to choose yeah. what I want to do <clears throat> first and then and then go back and do it. So. What is uh, so? So after, if you go in during residency, you're in 03. If you go in after residency, is it an 04 position? Depends. It, it could be an 04 or even 05 or 06, depending on, oh, you really? know. Yeah. So there, there's some people who just went in later in life in 06. There was a, mm. uh, there, was an, there was an orthopedic surgeon whose son, this is back, you know, about 10, 15 years ago during, in Iraq. His, mm. son, his son was killed, I believe. And he went in. Uh, joined the army and he was a senior guy like 60 years old but they mm. gave him an 06 position I feel yeah. like I've heard of that person before yeah uh, yeah that's interesting I don't think many people know kind of how that pathway works um, right and it's you know the I don't think the military itself produces many doctors I mean why would it right it yeah. doesn't make a whole lot of sense but they they certainly have plenty of opportunities for residencies 
There uh, is, yeah. Yeah, for at Sam Houston or Walter Reed or any – there's a lot of places. There's a lot of places yeah. to go. Mm-hmm. Um, there are more opportunities in the civilian world, which mm-hmm. is why sometimes uh, the military will allow – it's off, you know. It's uh, doctors, it's active duty doctors to do a residency in the mm-hmm. civilian world, but then have to come back and you know and uh, go to an MTF somewhere in the country. Yeah. Um. So four more months of that. Of that. But yeah. you're not. There's not a whole. Nothing unless, for me to do now. Unless yeah. something crazy happens, you're unless probably not going to do anything. Yeah. Um. So what made you decide to get involved in medicine in the first place? And then I guess how what 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 made you decide after that to. Uh, to get involved in the military? So um, both my parents are retired docs, mm. um, kind of grew up around it, just talk at the dinner table, going to their offices, just, you know, just that experience growing up around that, um, had an interest in that. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it would have been fine if I didn't choose that, but just, just you know, growing up in that atmosphere. Uh, and then in college, I had still hadn't decided whether or not, you know, what I wanted to do with medicine. Uh, I became an EMT and joined the local volunteer fire mm-hmm. department and did that. And that kind of solidified my uh, interest in, in medicine and, and service, actually. Mm-hmm. Um, I come from a Navy family. Uh, all of I'm third generation Navy. Everybody else is active duty. Mm-hmm. Um, but I wanted to serve, uh, you know, in some aspect. And mm-hmm. I knew that I would I'd want to serve as a doc, specifically the sur- you know, a surgeon and, and um, more specifically a reconstructive surgeon so right that that kind of developed as as my career unfolded or you know my path unfolded um but i knew i always wanted to come back and and serve in, to some extent sure yeah. yeah and now you run a private practice here in texas no i run a private practice yeah. and you uh are how many partners do you have there? just one just, just one. one yeah and you guys primarily do facial reconstruction uh we do everything um so i mm. used to be at ut a faculty there mm. in, in san antonio we did all the trauma that mm. came in through you know the city of san antonio so a lot of crazy stuff would roll in um you know some of those stories but yeah yeah um but then i decided uh you know during COVID we would leave and do our own and form our own practice mm. uh have, you know be, be more in control of of what we do and the patients we see but yeah i do a lot of facial reconstruction still mostly now for cancer um, for cancer, what do you mean? For like, head and neck cancer, whether it's skin cancer or mm. you know, cancer of the mouth. So like skin grafts or what, what, what's involved um, in that? Like skin, maxillofacial surgery yeah, and shit like that? Exactly, yes. Mm. Yeah. Skin grafts or flaps, like taking tissue from one part of the body mm. and transferring it to the face or stuff like that. Yeah. So medicine's come quite a long way in this regard. We're not oh, yeah. uh, putting pieces of plastic on people's, like literally on people's faces anymore with a strap around it. It's It's pretty pretty complicated what, what are some things that have changed recently and the reason this is a little off topic for this show but right. the reason i ask about it is because the work that you do gives people their lives back in a lot of ways right mm-hmm. so i'm just very curious about how it's progressed over the i mean what, what are some advances that have happened recently yeah, interestingly that uh the progression in plastic surgery as we know it started in world war one mm. um there was uh you know a lot of work done you know trench warfare Mm-hmm. head and neck injuries <clears throat> and people sticking their faces out of the trenches there's a lot of facial injuries so yeah. no one had done that before there was no textbook on that there was no you know, there was no class on how to how to do this reconstruction so it was kind of trial and error and um that progressed through world war ii vietnam and now through you know the modern modern warfare we have better technology mm-hmm. which um which includes microsurgery so we use microscopes to connect little blood vessels mm-hmm. that allow blood flow to bones and tissue that we transfer from one part of the body to another like for example we can reconstruct someone's jaw if it's mm. blown off using part of their fibula bone on their from right. their leg bringing that up cutting that to the shape of the mandible connecting the blood vessels so it heals in place and this is um, something like this kind of work uh is something that's gonna make limb salvage an actual possibility at some point right like the ability to do the micro surgeries and reconnect nerves reconnect blood reconnect bone to uh, bone and, and then and then tissue right yep. is like that's why the limb salvage thing usually fails it's like it, there's a there's no permanent limb salvage solution right now so far as i can tell there no there's not unfortunately and i think uh it's not necessarily the mic can you know can we put things back together mm. sure now putting things back together versus them functioning later right. on are two different things. Yeah, so yeah. you can certainly put a leg back on, but are they going to be able to walk or, mm. or, you know, push off or jump or that mm. sort of thing? Probably not. Um, and the main factor is the nerves and the yeah. nerves have to grow back and it take a long time to grow back. And at some point those muscles just, just quit. 
and when the nerve reaches them, there's, there's no there's a point of no return where those muscles will never come back. We used to think that about the brain too until DMT, right? Right. I mean, like regenerative uh, uh, neural tissue is something that after what 24, 25 just stops, and right. then but now with you know certain types of drugs, we can stimulate that to some degree again. Sure. Yeah, and, and there's a lot of research being done mm. in the basic science labs for that. This is more of a muscle issue than yeah, yeah. than it is a nerve issue. So those mm. muscles, if you know, like, you know, you don't work out for a while, your muscles atrophy. Right. Mm. But if you cut the nerve and you let that muscle sit, those muscles, not only they atrophy, they fibrose. So they become very, like, they're just like fibrotic mm. where the, the actual muscle tissue will not move um, or mm. function the same way it does. But now, I, you know, I'm sure there's a way to reverse that, but sure. that hasn't been found yet well we're we're growing meat in a lab now right and i don't yeah mean, i don't mean to be reductive but that's probably along the same kind of line that's right right all right yeah. uh that's all just super interesting to me the real point of this show uh is that we we have this problem in society i think that's come been coming for some time where we sacrifice uh our liberty or individual liberty for convenience and comfort and and it doesn't make a lot of sense to me frankly but um there's a lot of people out in the community particularly young young ish men men in their teens 20s and 30s who are trying to figure out what they can do because people are you know deeply patriotic not necessarily about the government or politicians or anything but about I maybe just the fuck you ideal of America. Like, Hey, we're going to do what we want, man. Mm -hmm. I don't care what you think, but figuring out where to start is, is problematic. I think it's, it's the, the, that barrier to entry is a problem in dieting. It's a problem in working out. It's a problem in education. People just don't know where to start a lot of the time. And that's why the industry of quote unquote self-help is so, so large, but you know, reflecting on it, the stuff that we've seen, over the past couple of decades, it seems like most of these people are hucksters. They're just, they're just grifting off the pain and it's irritating to me. Yeah, I agree. I think that's uh, you know, social media is a blessing and a curse, as you know, mm -hmm. and there's, you know, great applications for social media, but then people take advantage of that as well. And you can see you go on Instagram or you go on TikTok or whatever, whatever platform and you see that, you know, sign up for my entrepreneurial entrepreneur class and you can make, uh, you know, a million dollars in six months like I did or, you know, stuff like that. And everybody, there's, you know, there's a lot of victims out there that fall, that fall, you know, that, you know, they prey on. Right. And um, th there's a lot of confusing, you know, confusing messages out there to the, to the youth, like you're saying. And I think that um, it, it's really hard for someone to really grasp at what, you know, what's right and what's wrong. Mm. Um, and it really takes a lot of work and research, I think, on your own to really figure out you know what what's the what the right thing is and there there's never one right answer right but there there isn't uh one right answer but in a way there is i guess uh there's like specifics there's certainly never going to be a right answer because all the situations are different but right. um <clears throat> our our impulse over the past couple of decades to uh ask for help from external entities like the government and things like that uh that's a bad idea. Um, and it's, it's a bad idea that's made worse when, when, when you're unwilling to fulfill your part of the contract, I guess, for lack of a better phrase, because, uh, you know, one of the, the singular premise of this show is that you can whine about your rights and appeal to governing authorities about your rights so that they can uh, secure them for you. And you will be a subject, right? You will be uh, a, a servant of those people because they control your your life. Or you can exercise the responsibility that is required of you to secure those rights, and then you will be a citizen. And that's why I named the show that. Right. I feel like um, <clears throat> it's a it's it's kind of a difficult thing to communicate to people without sounding cynical, to be honest. But ultimately you have to do things yourself. That's kind of how life works. So it's, we have this idea that these days that there's this um, umbrella of security, whether it be government or whatever else that protects us from all this existential shit. But the reality of the situation is everything is built from the ground up, just like every other structure in nature, right? That's right. Including the ones that we built. So I wonder 
I mean, you're, you've been through uh, quite a bit. You've seen some pretty fucked up shit over, over the, the years. Um, you know, I wonder from your perspective, what is it, what does it look like to start turning these people around? You know, what, what kind of, what package of information, insight, motivation, whatever can you give to somebody so they can, you know, jettison all this bullshit and move forward with their lives? Yeah, I think, you know, going back to your point, starting from the ground up, you know, I think it's safe to say that probably our parents, you know, yours and mine, mm. um, came from a different generation. And the way they brought us up were probably different than the way parents are bringing up their children today. Sure. And I think that... Um, the way you raise your children is critical to to their development and to the mm. future for these young adults and these millennials, you know, or Gen Z, whoever out there now. Their the parenting probably um, was not uh, you know ideal and catering to the child's every need and you know making sure that they're always the winner and always right and always you know coddled and that sort of thing. Then they go out into the real world and expect the same from their local government or the federal government or, 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 you know, the company they work for, you know, why can't you give me these benefits, you know, that sort of thing. So mm. I think that it all starts from the beginning, like you were saying, and, I, you know, parenting um, is critical. And I think, you know, the next generation of parents or the current generation of parents with very young kids should be taking notes and figure, you know, and trying to figure out, you know, how, what's the best way to raise my child so they, they can all grow up into a world where, you know, it's better than it is now. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, it's like, uh, and I and I, I caution against the good old days mentality because yeah, we, the way we raise our children now is stupid. Yep. Um, but, <clears throat> and the way our parents did it was certainly different. It was, uh, I mean, I remember being told as a child with my younger sister or with some younger cousins, like if somebody falls down and starts crying, you, you help them up, but you don't coddle them because it doesn't exactly. do them any good to treat them like a victim. That was a pretty well-known thing back mm -hmm. then. Um, now it doesn't mean the reason I don't like the good old days mentality is because it doesn't mean that everything they did was right. That's so, right. You know what I mean? When you, right. you need to be a skeptic about things. So what worked and what didn't work, the latch key kid thing did not work. Mm -hmm. Right. Because it didn't create, the idea was two parents are both working latch key situation is going to make this child more responsible because they have to take care of themselves. Well, it didn't work out that way, did it? Mm -mm. I mean, it made us dependent on government infrastructure instead of family infrastructure. And that right. was a huge fucking mistake that we made. Um, and you know, it, it's, it's myopia. We try to solve these problems downstream <clears throat> instead of upstream. And there's a number of reasons for that. One, it's difficult sometimes to identify problems upstream and root causes, things like that, but also because we're lazy and stupid. Um, the, the idea that you're going to, well, that just is what it is, and we'll solve that later. That's the, especially with a child, it's the wrong attitude to have, right? I think, you know, in, you know, just because I'm a doc, you kind of apply this to healthcare and, and medicine in, in a, you know, in general, is that mm. you have a lot of people now in their older years being treated for hypertension, mm. high cholesterol, when this is stuff that should have been prevented by a healthy diet and exercise, or right. just, you know, lifestyle changes. Mm. And now, you know, now they're slapping a Band-Aid on it with a medication um, instead of, you know, snuffing it out at the root cause. You know, and it, I, I guess, look, it's hard, it's hard for everybody to live, leave a healthy lifestyle or lead a healthy lifestyle. But again, it starts from the beginning, right? Sure, yeah. I mean, I guess it is. But that those are... You solve those problems as low as possible, and then you move upward. So, right. like, you can control your own life, and then we can, as a community, deal with things like food deserts and shit like that, right? Right. Uh, right. But I think, to your point on, since you were in the medical community, the this is this is what <laughs> when you sacrifice personal responsibility for convenience you give somebody else or some other entity power over you ultimately that's exactly right, right. so yeah. instead of taking a couple of extra steps or eating the right food or whatever it is people have depended on a pill right and mm -hmm. i one of the most obvious examples of that are uh, uh blood pressure and um statins those are the high yeah. blood pressure high <clears throat> cholesterol medications. Yeah. yeah blood pressure cholesterol and uh, boner pills too, right? Mm -hmm. Dick pills. Like the, for the vast majority of people with ED, the problem is blood flow, right? Right. And that is, just, that is something you can solve without taking a pill, mm -hmm. frankly, not to like the NO2 guys 
won the Nobel Prize for it because it's incredible technology. Mm -hmm. uh, but it should be used to make us better, not to repair our laziness. Right. Because that's there's a there's a there's a price to pay for that, and there's a price physiologically to pay for that, but there's also a price to pay with the power that we've given the pharmaceutical industry in this country. They have the largest the largest lawsuits in the history of the world. All of them are the pharmaceutical industry having mm -hmm. to pay people like billions and billions of dollars. And it happens routinely every four or five years. There's a massive, like multi-billion dollar right. lawsuit. And how much of an impact does it have on the actual company? It's not much probably, right? <sighs> no, I mean, it hasn't. Cause they continue on. So far as I know, it hasn't stopped a single company. Right. I don't know any pharmaceutical company that's gone out of business. There's, there was one that AIDS medication guy that jacked up prices and went to jail for it. Mm -hmm. But that medication is still being sold at an inflated rate now. Right. Just by somebody else. Right. So, um, it's a good analog for how everything else in our lives goes, like how we've treated mortgages. In, in 1960, uh, uh, the average annual income for someone uh, was like, I think $10,000 a year or something like that. And a house cost 2,500 bucks. Like yeah. a, a three bedroom home was 2,500 bucks. So a third basically of your annual income. Now, People routinely, actually, as a matter of course, the minimum you're going to pay for a home is three times your annual salary, if not 10 times your annual salary mm -hmm. now. Why? Right? I mean, yeah. what's, and, and, and think about that, just us allowing that as a community and, and what it's done to us creating housing crisis after housing. We're, we're about to go into another one now. Exactly. Yeah. I think, uh, you know, we, in the last 60, 70 years, we, you know, we've gone from the family uh, structure to more everybody's become a consumer to some mm. extent you know whether it's uh you know you're looking at uh, drug commercials on tv or um you that know, that to me like you're in medicine i want to hear you expand on that because the idea that pharmaceutical companies are running individual ads for drugs on television is fucking crazy to me it's crazy it's absolutely crazy so you know the it's you know obviously people can do what they want mm. There's no regulations against that, obviously, but, you know, in my opinion, they shouldn't be feeding patients with this information. This, this, you know, the drug option should be given straight to the doctors and the mm. doctors should be deciding what, you know, with the patient, they can, you know, they can talk with the patient about it, but also give, that's the thing is you have to have informed consent, whether it's giving a patient a new medication or if I go into surgery, the patient needs to understand the risks, the benefits and alternatives if right. there are. And I go over every, you know, that with every patient before you roll back to the operating room. Mm. And, you know, in the fine print, very quickly at the end of the commercial, they have that with further drugs because <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. required, but no one pays attention to that. No. And then they show up into the office. Now, I, I'm a surgeon, so I don't deal with drugs that much, but, right. I, but I still have dealt with them and I have patients coming in requesting certain mm. drugs because they saw it on TV, mm. not because it's the right one for them. Right. Or maybe they should be doing something else with mm. their lives to, you know, eat better or, you know, or exercise instead of taking a drug. People want the easy way out, like you were talking about. Yeah. And I think, you know, taking a pill is much easier than joining a gym sure, or, yeah. you know, going and getting healthy food. And it's, you know, just from, um, I, I get the sense that people on, on the left, leftists, not Democrats necessarily, but certainly leftists are trying to push this idea that holding people accountable is somehow cruel. It's not even about holding them accountable for justice sake. It's for your sake. Like holding yourself accountable will drastically improve, drastically and immediately improve your life. You know what I mean? Anything that you're going through that's negative, uh, anxiety, stress, depression, uh, uh, weight issues or whatever, health issues in general, unless it's cancer or something like that, or some kind of congenital defect. Something that you can't help. Yeah, yep. almost like the vast majority, people die of heart disease in this country more than anything else, right? And well, I mean, part of that is, is lifestyle. Some yeah. of it is genetic. There, there's, there's some genetic. There's some but genetic the, component to it, but, but we, a lot of it is, is, is the Western diet. It's like 33 to 35% of the country is obese. You right. know what I mean? That's unacceptable. I think it's higher than that, actually. Well, but, it, it depends on your definition, right. but I like 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 fat, not, not the, uh, uh, BMI definition of obese, but actually obese. Yep. You know what I mean? It's, it's how can a third of our country be like that? And, and what, how, what good are you doing as, as a, as a representative of the public trust to 
try to convince everybody that that's okay and that the best thing to do for these people is to coddle them and tell them that it's beautiful or okay. I, that, that to me is evil. You know, it, you know, saying, saying this is beautiful is one thing, but saying this is healthy is a totally different thing. Mm. You know, you can call someone beautiful. That's, that, you know, be, you know, beauty's in the eye of the beholder, right? Sure, but, fair enough. But, uh, but being healthy is a totally different thing. I mean, in every field of medicine, in all of our research journals, being obese carries significant health risks with it. And specifically in my field in plastic surgery, if you have a BMI of higher than 30, mm. you are much higher, I mean, you're at a much higher risk for infection and complications post-operative, post-operatively, mm. regardless of what surgery. Or well, even you have. cardiac issues during the pro- the procedure, right? Correct. Like using uh, uh, drugs to to you know put people to sleep and stuff like that while you can do your work becomes more and more problematic the more stress there is routinely on the heart. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And a lot of these medications uh, are lipid absorbable. So right. the, the more fat you have, yep. the more gets stored and it, it's harder for them to wake up at the end and they're more sleepy and then they can have airway problems. So it is to an extent more dangerous. Now we do things obviously to mitigate that mm-hmm. danger. But, um, but yes, being overweight and being obese is dangerous to your health. It's a good point. Uh, so... For those who don't know, I, I talk about it on some of the other shows. It doesn't really come up much on this show, but um, lipid lipids in nature are a carrier for mm-hmm. other things, right? That's right. So um, MCT oil, for example, if you're taking vitamins and supplements and you're not taking it with MCT, you're not actually taking anything. It's just going right through your system. Mm-hmm. You may catch a couple of things, but it's just not working. That's why you know some of these newer high fat diets are people are like, oh, I ate a bunch more fat and all of a sudden my cholesterol went down. How is that possible? Because you're actually getting the nutrients you need and it's not sugar. Right. You know what I mean? Um, but <clears throat> anytime there, there's two predictors of the groups of people in society that are going to be most affected by some kind of negative shit, disease especially. Uh, poverty, obviously, but lack of access to medical care and then obesity. Mm-hmm. Because, I mean, we saw it with COVID. And it wasn't People got the wrong idea about this. They thought, well, people who are fat get COVID and get sicker because, uh, you know, there's more weight on their lungs or they're, they have lower cardiovascular uh, uh, resistance and things like that. And to some degree, that's true. But really, it's the virus eats up your fucking body because fat is literally all over all of your organs. Let me let me briefly touch on that real quick because I, sure. I have firsthand experience with this. Okay. So that, that you know, when... Um, Governor Cuomo was, was crying out for help in New York City uh, yeah. back in March 2020. And, uh, you know, the president sent the military to New York City to help mm-hmm. out. All branches went, minus, actually the Marines went too to, you know, provide security. But, um, you know, all branches went, mostly docs, mostly nurses. Uh, but when we went, you know, it was a bunch of Navy docs and I, man, Manning and ICU in Brooklyn. And we had a 10-bed ICU, all, you know, all run by Navy docs and nurses, and every single patient was on the ventilator, and every single patient was obese, diabetic, and had other comorbidities, and 90, 90% of them died. There was nothing yeah. that we could do. We showed up there. The civilian doc there was like, hey, if you guys can save one out of 10, that's a win for us. Mm. So you know, we were like, are you kidding me? Like that, those numbers are, we've never seen those kind of numbers before, and then we show up there, and sure enough, that's what it was. And literally, we threw everything, kitchen sinks, at these, at these patients. I mean, there's not much you can do, though. It's like, I, it, it's like you're surrounded by this bubble of material that literally carries the virus everywhere. And right. it's like when, if you look at uh, an unhealthy, obese heart, it, there's like just fat packed all around it. Yep. And the lungs, there's fat packed all around them. And man... This is just like basic biology. We've known this forever. It's not even just the fat. It's, you know, typically if someone is obese, mm. their diet isn't great, obviously, sure, yeah. right? And so they're not taking the, the proper uh, nutrients, vitamin D, all the, you know, all the so vitamins. So the uh, immune system is also weak. So the immune weak, system yeah. is also, you know, weakened. And, um, and because of that, and, and their, um, their uh, insulin and sugar control is mm. out of whack if they're diabetic. Typically, if you're obese, you may have some insulin resistance mm. to an extent, whether or not you're diabetic. And that all plays a huge role in uh, your immune system. Mm. And when it's all out of whack, then the virus can, you know, take control. And when we showed up there, we didn't know, like, this was early COVID. Mm. And, you know, we all showed up there like, 
It was like the middle of 2020, die. right? Like yeah. May or so of yeah. 2020. In fact, like I was talking to Tom Saturday about yeah. it like when we, when, we de- mm. when we got deployed there. And he's like, hey, man, this is like more dangerous than anything I've did. I was like, uh, whoa, 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 Tom. Like, I don't, I don't know about that. But, you know, yeah. but we went there. We mm. didn't know what was going to happen. Yeah. You know, within a few days of getting there, we kind of relaxed a little bit and realized like, okay, it's cool. Like, we're all healthy. It's right. going to be okay. Um, but again, those patients that we were taking care of, you know, unfortunately, they were just not healthy to begin with. Right. And, you know, it's, I, I don't, I'm not telling people to lose weight to be a dick. Just like a drill sergeant isn't telling you that you're weak to be a dick. It's happening because that weakness is going to get you killed. Right. You know what I mean? It's because if you're unhealthy, it's going to kill you. you know, like if you want to be around for your kids' weddings and for your grandchildren, right? And you don't want to be a burden on people for the rest of your life, then you have to do that yourself. And I I bring it back. The reason I wanted to have you on in the first place is because medicine over the last 20 years or so and how we've coddled people and told them that it's okay and then the way we've treated the last two years especially, this idea that there's just no responsibility on the individual to do anything is something it's an idea that permeates through our culture whether it be financial or political or or uh, with regard to your mental health and all this other stuff we just continuously lean towards coddling people instead of trying to empower them to solve their problems Mm -hmm. you know what i mean and that doesn't that you there's no fucking school of leadership that would teach you to behave this way it does not exist you know i can tell you that um you know all of these uh news articles in the past two and a half or even the past two decades yeah. for that matter that have been put out and saying, oh, this, you know, this study, this medical study shows this is detrimental to your health or this is healthy for you or take this medication. Well, if you look at the fine print on all these studies, mm. it's either, um, you know, pharma sponsored. Yeah, meaning, brought to you by Pfizer. Yeah. Right. Brought to you by some pharma, you know, mm. pharmaceutical company or the docs who, you know, are doing the study have some sort of link, you know, you have to dig, but have some sort of link to it. You know, sure. look, I mean, there's plenty of honest research out there, but the ones that are typically published in the media, mm or, you know, are questionable. And I'd say the last two and a half years has really, you know, has really upset me in the fact that I would trust the medical journals, sure, yeah. you know, as, as honest work. And now it's really hard for me to look at a study and be like, hmm, I don't know if I can use this information and change my practice, because right, I'm yeah, not yeah. sure if this is yeah. re- you know real or not. Well, now there's preprint, which is the worst thing that's probably happened to medicine in a very long time. I mean, it, it typically three to five year process to get something in a medical journal, lots of data, peer review and all this stuff. And now because of how quickly everybody was trying to solve COVID, uh, which by the way, you could have done that with your diet, but how quickly everybody was trying to solve COVID, there's something called preprint now, which is where <clears throat> people collect data and do a study and then preprint it without any peer review. And it's out there and it's the same as a newspaper accusing somebody of something and then they'll print the retraction on page 50. Yep. You know what I mean? It'll be above the fold on the front page when it gets posted, but to retract it, it's buried somewhere deeply. And that becomes part of the institutional knowledge of our country. People are like, oh, this is this must be true. It's printed there. The New England Journal of Medicine, yeah. Lancet, and I think maybe Nature too, all published stuff on COVID the last two and a half years and retracted it yep. in a very similar fashion. Yep. And, and then and those the, the New England Journal biggest... of Medicine is the preeminent medical journal on earth, or it used to be. The, right? That Lancet and Nature are yeah. all like the three top in the world. And, you know, we used to look up to you. And like, if you got a paper published in one of those journals and you, like you were a big timer, yeah. right? It took, like you said, years mm-hmm. of going back and forth sometimes to, you know, get uh, edits on the, on the actual study and paper to, in order for it to be published. And now there's actually something called open source journals now. So there's the regular journal and then you can send in a paper or a research paper. You can mm-hmm. write whatever you want, basically. Yeah. And if you pay $2,500 or $3,000, they'll publish it. It, very little review as long as you give them their fee they'll publish it so you know it's open source anybody can access it mm. but but basically it's like wikipedia in the medical field like any, <laughs> anybody can publish it as long as you can pay for it yeah that's uh that that doesn't sound great to nope. be honest man yeah i mean it's like i i went to uh eight or so years of college myself and i don't recall if i used wikipedia <clears throat> as a source on something, I would be fucked. And now, you know, these medical journals are allowing 
or, or even in some, in some ways passively promoting the idea of using this unverified information to treat actual people's lives. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know. I don't know what to really say about that. I mean, that's the, the word it's do no harm has a lot of implications, right? It is. It isn't just don't pick up a hammer and smash some dude's fucking face in. Yeah. It's also you think about every single action you take, and if there's going to be some uh, uh, first, second, third order effect that harms people, right? That's that's the that that's the oath. And exactly, do no harm. And I think you know the last two and a half years with COVID, um, you know, you really had this dichotomy of mm-hmm. the doctors. I mean, th- like there were people on that were split. It was it was such a, you know bipolar thing you had doctors on one side of you know with the vaccine or treatments and one and doctors on the complete opposite side and there's really not many people in the middle yeah maybe some but but again the doctors on one side were ostracized mm-hmm. as you know yep. and their licenses were you know threatened and their practices were threatened versus the other ones now who's to say who's right i don't know time will time will tell i think we already know but you know yeah, well. but uh you know the fact that these doctors were, you know, their careers and their livelihoods were potentially threatened or ruined because of things they said, which were not necessarily untrue, right? Well, yeah, I mean, so uh, just this week, actually, we find that Pfizer, not only did they n- not know whether or not transmissibility was affected by their vaccine, but now we know that they didn't even test for it before Correct. they released the drug. Right. That seems like it'll become a lawsuit at some point. I, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of lawsuits. Mm-hmm. Now, whether or not they actually you know, amount to anything, we'll, we'll see. But yeah, I mean, there's certainly going to be a lot of lawsuits coming down the pipe, I think. But it's, you know, this erosion of institutional trust is a real fucking problem. That's what upsets me the most yeah. about this is that, and I, and I see Because they're it. trading on your honor, essentially. It's the same. It's just like somebody stealing valor in the military or even an actual veteran doing something fucked up in the name of veterans. Right. Like you're trading on my honor here, bud. It's an unspoken code, right? I mean, it's, yeah. you know, whether you're a veteran or as a physician, like th- that, that oath you take, mm. whether it's to the country or, t- you know, the Hippocratic oath, it, it's something that you really have to uphold daily yeah. and people take it for granted. And they're sort of, look, there are bad people in every, in every sure, profession. Yeah. But I'll tell you, the last two and a half years have, has really like eroded the trust between the doctor and the patient. Yeah, for sure. I have patients come in who will tell me what I need to do for them <laughs> because they, you know, looked it up on Wikipedia or e-medicine sure, or whatever it yeah. is. Yeah. And, um, and then when I tell them, you know, my opinion, my professional opinion, mm. they get upset with me and that sort of thing. And it's stuff I've never seen before. Mm. And it's the last two years. Look, it doesn't happen often. But it's happened in the last two years, and I've started to notice it. And it's not just me; it's my my buddies around the country have mm-hmm. seen this as well. So the you know the process historically for something like this to regain trust in an institution is that there has to be an uh, there has to be a reckoning, right? There has to be a a a, a very truthful, direct, brutal conversation about what went what happened who was right and who was wrong and why, what the motivations were, and the people who did the wrong things have to go. They have to be expunged from the community because otherwise people won't trust it again. Yeah, that's right. And that, that's probably the hardest thing to accomplish. Mm-hmm. And, you know, who, there's a lot of money involved in this. There's a lot of money involved. A lot in of this, power, right. yeah. A lot of power. And, and, you know, someone like you and me, it's, it's very difficult to do. But, again, power in numbers, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, starting at the foundation of this country – you know, it's, it's a, you know, it's for the people and Mm. by the people. Right. So I think that, you know, eventually there will be a reckoning and whether it's going to be, you know, this year or 10 years or who knows, Mm. but uh, you know, it's, it's really heading down, heading in that direction. And I'll talk to you, you know, talk to you about the healthcare, the healthcare system here is like with the insurance companies, right? These big insurance companies. Yeah. You, you, you can speak on this. So I've, I've told people this a lot before, even a lot of my, um, a lot of my left-leaning friends have come to this realization over the years with Obamacare. It's essentially a handout to uh, to private insurance companies, more mm-hmm. or less, right? It's like seventy percent of the money we spend on healthcare goes to administrative shit and and and, and insurance companies. Yeah. that seems really stupid to me. I mean, you'll see this. So, you know, as a doctor, um, every year, blue, the main, the big insurance companies 
big payers will send out a letter saying, hey, we're, we're cutting reimbursements by 3% in this, by 2% here, by 4% here. But every year, it's a small percentage cut. And mm. over time, that amounts to a lot of money. And 2% or 3% of, of reimbursement is actually a lot of money per year. And then they increase your premiums as the as your as a patient you increase your premiums mm. so you see where this is going right they're they're paying the doctors less but making their patients pay more so they're just pocketing more money and doctors it comes to a point where there are surgeries that we just won't do anymore because they don't reimburse and we actually end up having to pay to do these surgeries because i have to pay to keep the lights on i have to pay to pay my staff you know so if they're not reimbursing then we just don't do them and then that affects the um, the access of healthcare to these patients, whether it's for breast reconstruction, for breast recan, mm-hmm. you know, breast cancer in, in my field, or facial reconstruction, you know, some of these some of these patients have to go to other cities in order to get their um, their surgeries because doctors in town won't accept their insurance <laughs> because it doesn't pay anything. That's really stupid. And look, I mean, you know, you, doctors are altruistic, and the and these companies prey on the doctors' mm. altruism, knowing that hey, we're still going to take care of patients. <clears throat> and look, I've taken care of plenty of patients who didn't pay. And that's just, that's kind of the, like you said, like the, the Hippocratic Oath. But at the same time, we have a business to run and we have to pay our staff. We have to keep right. the lights on. We have to make money to an extent. Mm. We're not, we're not, you know, we're not going to be making money to go play in the golf course, but we have to run a business. Right. Yeah. It's and just it, common sense stuff. And it's the, the mechanics, the economics of healthcare in America are so fucked. I mean, let, let's start from the, the penalty side, I guess, for lack of a better phrase. Eighty-three percent of all private bankruptcies in the United States are filed because of unpaid medical expenses. Eighty-three percent in the richest country in the history of the world, we tell people you can be as healthy as you can afford to be. Mm-hmm. So just from the baseline, we are completely ethically wrong about what we're doing right now. Now, there's bureaucratic bloat in any situation like this. Anytime the government's involved, or any, frankly, anytime something gets large, there's going to be bureaucratic bloat, whether the government's involved or not. We spent 4.3 trillion on healthcare last year. Mm-hmm. 75 or so percent of that is on insurance and administrative fees. So really, we should spend about a trillion dollars, give or take, as an entire country on healthcare. So you're talking about going from <clears throat> 16 or so percent of our GDP to uh, 24th. Yep. Right. It's not even close. Uh, and and the the quality of care has not risen with the cost which is also a problem quality care has gone down yeah because a lot of these doctors are now being bought out by these private equity firms who just care about the bottom line and not about patient care so they need the doc hey instead of seeing 20 patients a day you need to be seeing 40 patients a day and by the way we're also cutting your reimbursement so you're going to be seeing twice as many patients getting paid three quarters of what you normally get paid so docs are like no i'm not doing this i'm gonna go off my own or you know what am i going to do now some of them don't have choices. And, and, and that affects the quality of care, not only because there's a lack of doctors, but also because if you're seeing 20 patients in a eight hour day, you have more time to spend with them, to listen to mm-hmm. them about their problems and to, to diagnose problems and to treat them. But if you have to go through 40, but you're, you're also, spending two or three minutes in a room with them yeah. and then out. You're also building a rapport with them. So when they right. hear some harebrained shit on Wikipedia or WebMD and they ask you about it, you're like, no, it's actually this, right? You're, you you become the known entity and not their friend on Facebook. The doctor patient relationship yeah. has been destroyed by many things, and that's also a reason as well. Like you're mm-hmm. saying, and I, I totally agree with that. Um, you know, it, you used to be able to sit down with the patient, spend time with them, and talk to them mm-hmm. about their diagnosis or their treatment, and develop a rapport. And hey, you know, how are your kids doing? I heard you know heard so and so went off to college, that sort mm-hmm. of thing. And those little things make that personal relationship. Yeah. Um, you know, benefits the patient. Yeah, and it's, you know, I, I I think it's very obvious what the problems are. Um, and, you know, solutions come in numbers, as you said before, but it takes a lot of time for that to happen, right? frankly. So, you know, from your perspective as a physician, somebody that's witnessed all of this shit, both on the government side and on the private side over the last several years or so, what, kind of, what, what do you recommend the average person do? to like take back control of their own personal health. So I don't know if you heard of these, but they're, they're increasing popularity now, these uh, healthcare collectives. Mm. So um, it's an, basically an insurance plan and they're usually local so or it's, it's regional. Al- it's almost like a, um, what do you call it? Um, 
uh, credit union, but for healthcare. Yeah, something exactly. Like that. To yeah. an extent, right? Yeah. So they, um, you know, you pay a certain fee per month, mm. um, and then uh, you know you go and do your regular healthcare checkups, and if there's any issue where you're hospitalized, you go to the ER. Mm. That that healthcare collective will pay the bill. Mm. Actually, sorry, they you pay the bill, and then they reimburse you okay. pretty, you know, within a few weeks or something mm. like that. And every company is different, but the you get the the doctor or the ER or the hospital whatever gets paid in full, which is much better than insurance because insurance will pay you a fraction of what you sure. bill. Well, I mean, if you if you've ever th- another thing, not not to uh, steal any of your thunder, if you were going to mention this, but paying the cash price at the dentist or at the clinic or something like that, you're going to save quite a bit of money exactly. doing that. Like oh, quite yeah. a bit of money. Quite a bit of money. Because you, right. you skip all the administrative fees. Mm-hmm. You're going to pay somewhere around 30 to 40% of what you normally would have paid. Yep. And I, I don't think people know that. Just think about, you know, you may, you may be, you know, for your, if you have a you know wife and two kids or whatever, mm-hmm. you have a family, so, you know, you may be paying $2,500 a month, $1,500 a month for, you know, for healthcare. And then you have a deductible. That's and five thousand dollars, right, maybe, right? right? And then copays <laughs> on top of that. So really, if you were to go, you know, to your primary care doctor to get health care checkup, mm. it's probably like two two hundred fifty bucks or something like that. Mm. When you're when you're paying what fifteen thousand a year and then some, yeah. to you know to get that. I mean, it's just it's absurd. Yeah, it's it's absolute nonsense. And then uh, you know that that's interesting. Healthcare collectives are there some around here in Texas? There are, yeah. There's one in there's one I know of in San Antonio that I've had patients uh, from, mm-hmm. and there's um, one up in Austin as well. Uh, and I'm sure they're all over the place. I can give you the names off off the air, but um, mm-hmm. I was thinking of actually switching out to them. Yeah, I mean, myself. I'm, yeah, that sounds really interesting. Uh, and if if I get into one, I'll let you guys know because I don't have any kind of I don't have any legal qualms with doing that. But uh, yeah. Like you, you know, you have interests, but, um, yeah, it is what, what else? I mean, aside from healthcare collectors, what are the day to day things people can do to like reclaim their health? I know diet is a big part of it. I mean, I, you know, it's, it's really like, I don't know how many times you can hammer this home, but diet and diet and, mm. you know, just, you don't have to go to the gym and bench press 300 pounds. Just you don't walking. have to go one, you don't have to go run a marathon, yeah. but, but just walking, just being active, yeah. you know, putting down the remote, not, not binge watching Netflix instead mm. go out for a 30 minute walk. It's mm. really not that bad. Yeah. Um, and just healthy diets that all of that, that that's, those are the simplest and the cheapest. It's, it, it doesn't cost you anything to go mm. walk. What part of the American diet right now do you think is most destructive aside from overeating, which we do as well, but I well, definitely overeating. Mm. And I think that, um, it, you know, there's a lot of diet trends that are, that are ineffective and probably detrimental to your health. Like what? Um, you know, these juice cleanses and all, <laughs> you know, all these things that you are have just, a, a liver and a pancreas to cleanse your body. You don't have to drink juice. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It just it, like st- none of this stuff makes sense. If you do like, if you just spend a little time and do a little research, you realize that like, these yeah. things are stupid. Yeah. You know, and um, there is some really good data and research out there by uh, dietitians and some docs who are really um, interested in um, in healthcare. And I don't, mm-hmm. you know Joe Rogan speaks to this about mm-hmm. the the, the um, carnivore diet. Mm-hmm. There is benefit to that. Sure. I mean, there are there are things out there that are proven to <clears throat> to be healthy. Not saying that look, you not everybody should be a you know carnivore only diet, right. but you know don't go to Whataburger every day for, sure, for lunch. Yeah. You know, there, yeah. there are things that you can simply do. You can go to HEB and pre, you know, you can make a sandwich for yourself and bring it to work instead of going to Whataburger, that sort of thing. There's, there's and you could still um, maintain it on a good budget. Mm. You don't, it doesn't have to be expensive right, to, eat, yeah, yeah. to eat healthy. Yeah, and, and it's like, uh, I hear some of the barriers or rebuttals to things like that. Like, well, high red meat diets, for example, um, have a correlation with higher rates of, prostate cancer like okay cool yeah if you don't eat any fiber right right like you you have to eat fiber otherwise you're going to die like elvis with 45 pounds of meat stuffed up your ass basically right you know i it, so this is the thing is like you know it even goes back to the framingham study mm. from many many years ago mm. like, you know all of these studies there are so many um you know factors that they they, they fail to factor in that you know sure increasing read, eating a lot of red meat may increase your prostate cancer but mm. what else is going on that they're not reporting on right yeah. what else I mean, it increases your doing? hemoglobin so but you can you know staying be- hydrated better right and eating more uh, uh or eating more fiber whether it's green vegetables or whatever else can offset that right and i think look if if you do only one thing whether it's eating cereal only cereal or only meat or yeah. only fish well we're omnivores right? <laughs> yeah 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 we're meant to eat yeah. different things and if you do only one thing well that that could be harmful mm. to you so everything in moderation. 
And I think there's not, you know, you can certainly have your cake and eat your cookies and still be a healthy, you know, mm-hmm. you lead a healthy diet. I sure. like cookies, yeah. but I, you know, I, but I work out and I eat yeah, healthy yeah. generally. So, and you don't have to abide by this strict bodybuilder diet. Well, if you want to do something in life, you got to pay the price for it. Right. That's the, that's the simple answer. Right. Right. And I think it's something that, that dovetails back into something that we run into a lot uh, in our communities, which is this mental health crisis Mm -hmm. in the, the late two thousands, early 2010s, everybody thought it was just veterans, right? It turns out it's everybody, everybody. Um, there's a number of reasons for it. I think the nihilism in society is a big factor, but, uh, testosterone rates have gone down about 40% since 2001 and the average, at least in the average adult male, a 21-year-old today has 40% less testosterone than his counterpart in 2001. It's a big fucking problem, right? Do you think that's a that's a um, a product of the, I would say, just staying at home, being on a computer, playing video games, sure, not yeah. being outside, not I mean, doing... Think about wild hogs, right? right? So they you put them out in the woods, and within two generations, they start to grow their tusk again. Mm-hmm. And then if you domesticate them, they lose their tusk. Right. You know what I mean? Right. So what do you think is happening to you when you're sitting at home not doing anything, not exercising your fucking man muscle or mm-hmm. whatever you want to call it, right? You're going to lose that. Your body thinks this, this again is very basic biology. <clears throat> and it's, and it's, it's how uh, chronic traumatic encephalopathy works as well. Your brain becomes damaged and your brain is like, okay, well, that is inefficient. I'm not going to send energy over there anymore. And the part of the brain dies. Mm -hmm. What do you think is happening to everything else in your body when you stop using it for its intended purpose? Right. Atrophy, right? We were talking about that earlier, right? So yeah, parts of the body atrophy, whether it's the brain or the muscle or whatever it may be. I mean, if if you're not up and walking around, your bones get brittle too, Mm -hmm. right? So in every part of your body, um, you know, atrophy to an extent if you're not using it. And, and that's the the same thing to be said for hormones, testosterone, right? So, Um, I and think then, it's then this, these cortisol problems we're having as well, like mm-hmm. the, the stress hormone where our stress is now all internalized and it's not, you, you know, if you want to get rid of your love handles, go fucking do jujitsu, not because of the exercise, because you get put in, you exercise your stress hormone at that point. Right. It does what it's intended to do. It's not about, I mean, it, it's certainly part of it is the exercise, but you can exercise in a lot of different ways that don't involve challenging yourself like that and feeling Maybe not fear, but something akin to that. You know what I mean? That's why it's so effective for these people. When you see these, uh, uh, what you don't see are skinny fat dudes that do jujitsu. And there's a reason for it. That's and right. again, it's not yeah. just the exercises because the love handles, that's cortisol. Mm-hmm. That is you, re- you retaining cortisol. It's a big fucking problem for us, right? I think, you know, um, you know, our technology has advanced so much that we've almost gone backwards. You know, a, mm. a specific example of this is in plastic surgery, in the cosmetic plastic, plastic surgery space, there's a device called Cool Sculpting. I'm sure you've seen billboards for mm. it. You know, you put, you slap it on your side and your love yeah. handle and it's supposed to freeze away the fat, you know, a few treatments there and it's gone. Well, it's not really that, not really that effective. It's an, ex, mm. it's an expensive machine. So all these people who have it, I don't have it, by the way, all mm. these people who have it um, have to advertise in order to sell it to pay for the, pay for the device. Right. So they, they're really pushing it. It's not effective. And um, what is effective is going to do jujitsu mm-hmm. or going to work out or going or just being active to an extent that will take care of the problem. But um, people want this quick fix, whether it's a medication or a device that freezes your fat, and it can it basically snowballs this problem out of control mm-hmm. because hey, there's I can just go down the street to this uh, med spa mm-hmm. and take care of this instead of going to the gym. Yeah, but it's like uh, the vitamin C and D deficiencies that that we're experiencing as a culture right now, especially in the West. A lot of people are taking supplements for that right now, but Mm -hmm. it's not like I I had a conversation with Brett Weinstein about this uh, sometime last year. It's not obvious to biologists yet that the, the low vitamin D and light vitamin C aren't a symptom to be treated, but a symptom of something else that treating doesn't solve. Right. Right. So, Almost, and again, it's solving problems downstream and taking a pill instead of changing lifestyle. This is right? being, it's being, you know, it's fixing things in retrospect instead of being mm-hmm. proactive about it. And I think uh, being, <laughs> like you said, starting from the bottom, starting from the, the foundation of everything, mm-hmm. it, it, you know, it's critical to solving problems, no matter whether they're in healthcare, the country, politics, whatever it may be. Mm-hmm. Um, 
but yeah, I think putting a Band-Aid on it or slapping or giving someone a pill to swallow is not the answer. No, and that's why I bring it back to mental health because this suicide epidemic, I don't think it's just that. I think it's the, the nihilism manifests itself in a lot of different ways, whether it's gang violence or mass shootings in other countries, terrorism, right? Mm-hmm. It's the same, it's a symptom of the same disease and it is uh, unfocused, unpurposed male aggression. Male aggression has a biological, a very obvious biological purpose that we've, we've seen throughout human history right. to provide and protect, right? That's what it's for. And I've been doing, I'm, I'm, I've been writing stuff for um, <clears throat> some veteran suicide panels I'm going to be doing early next year. And I've, I, the more I read about it and the way it's being treated, the angrier I get because we're fucking up. We're, we're, we're giving people hugs and that's not what we should be doing. Because that's not how you treat a man who is depressed. You give him purpose again. That's how you fix that problem. Because that's the 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 depression is the symptom, but that's not the disease. This the goes di- back to the child falling down, crying. Correct. Yes. You know, you, you pick him back up, but don't give him a hug, right? Yep. Yeah. So it's like it, it's we're we're treating the symptom of rage or depression, but we're not treating the root cause, which is that aggression exists. And if it is not used to a very obvious purpose for the person, then it turns into external rage or they internalize the rage and internalized rage is ultimately depression, which leads to whatever the fuck, suicide or at least a, a life that's not as good as the one they could have lived. Yep. And not only does it hurt them, but it hurts everybody else who could have benefited from their service, right? Yeah, I think, look, I mean, no matter who, you know, what walk of life you, you're in, if you are in a high functioning position, whether it's, you know, uh, what you did, Mm. um, other veterans, tip of the spear kind of thing, Mm. um, pilots, doctors, people who are, you know, high functioning individuals who, you know, who need to be doing high functioning things. If you put, if you basically put a leash on them and, 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 you know, prevent them from doing things, they get more depressed. It snowballs out of, out of control. Right. Yeah. And that's where, that's where those, those bad things start happening. But I, again, you know, to what you said, giving them a purpose, mm. that's the critical thing to helping this uh, get better. Yeah. And it's no mystery why the, the rates of violent shit, whether it be suicide or external violence are uh, greater amongst people who are whatever high, fun- if you want to call it high functioning like that. Right. Because you get, like we used to think that <clears throat> 10 years ago, a, a doctor told me, well, your, your brain has been bathed in adrenaline so much that you just can't function without that adrenaline anymore. And I guess from a physiological perspective, that might be right. But to me, that's still a symptom, right? Mm-hmm. Because I can get that adrenaline in other places. I can, I can replicate that without having to go back to combat. I can get involved in things that I am passionate about, like yes. protecting people, yep. not necessarily just being a cop or a first responder but other ways right like using whatever skills that i have that i've developed or whatever position i'm in to help and protect other people that to me is the ultimate solution to the veteran suicide problem i think the common thing here with you know with you with me with you know other people in the space is that you know we all serve to one extent or another in the military Mm -hmm. um but then you leave the military and you continue serving, yeah. whether it's as a police officer, you know, an actual physical service mm. versus a mental service versus, you know, contributing to veterans help groups or even just contributing to your, you know, your local community, whether it's volunteering your local fire department or stuff like that. You know, it, I think that's a critical role. I mean, you know, there, there's there's something to be said for service to your community, whether it's, you know, your total, your city as a whole or just your local neighborhood, whatever it is. Um, that gives people purpose. And I think that that is also very important to, you know, bringing the community together mm-hmm. and and um, helping get rid of these issues. Yeah. I mean, it might be the most important part because yep. it's the foundation for everything else that happens, right. right? That the underlying idea and the motivation behind it affect everything no matter what the mechanics are right right so it's uh you know gandhi i I say this a lot on this show because i want to i want to drill it into people's heads but gandhi said that if you truly want to find yourself lose yourself in the service of others right exactly and i think you know i i don't know what it's like to be a woman so i don't know if that applies to them but i know goddamn sure that it applies to men you know what i mean and the way i say it is if you uh 
can turn your pain and suffering into empathy for others. You can save two lives, yours and theirs. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. And that, that is to me the purpose of life is to uh, find your purpose and your purpose will inexorably be sur are, are, are guided towards helping other people in some way. That's, mm -hmm. that's why we've built all these communities over the years, whether they're tribalistic and violent or whatever the fuck else we built them because we need other people. That's it. I think social media has torn some of this down, though, because you, know, you have people that are so focused on looking at the latest, you know, their latest influencers trend or whatever it may mm. be. And, and every, everybody is so it, they're like in their own little silos and there's no um, cooperation between people. There's right. no communication between people. The only communication is through DMs or whatever it may be. Yeah. And, um, you know, people don't have real physical yeah. eye to eye relationships anymore. And the inverse of that is that we're telling people now as a solution to the repercussion from that to take self-care measures, right? Yeah, it takes yeah, self-care day. Go, right? go look yeah. in the mirror and, and cry and post it on the internet instead of, you know, I, again, I, I want to bring it back to this. I'm not doing it to be a dick. Man the fuck up. Yep. I'm not being a dick. I'm telling you to man the fuck up because it will improve your life. Yep. Because that's the way it's supposed to work. It, it Somehow we've reduced this to some like argument over what's, nice life is not nice my man it's it sucks sometimes yeah and if you're not ready to fight back you will lose look i mean you know your basic training your your upbringing through the military wasn't easy mm. my training in surgery no one no one hands you things like mm. you know you're the, you're the bottom of the totem pole and then you have to make your way up and you sure. have to put the hard work in and and you know <clears throat> and take the punches but though you know that's uh that's wrong to do these days you yeah. have to be you have to be nice to everybody well, I'm not going to do that. I'll tell you, I'll tell you a great story is that when I, when I was finishing my training in St. Louis and who knows who's going to watch this, but, um, you, you know, so I was the, my last year as a resident, I was the chief resident. So mm. I was helping, I mean, I was basically the administrative resident for all the junior mm. residents looking over them. And there was a, you know, it had come to a point where the professionalism and the, and the dress code had kind of waned. Mm. And I said, and every Wednesday we had grand rounds. We had a, a, visiting, a visiting surgeon come in from where else to give mm. us a talk. I said, look, I require two things, all, all you guys. Show up on time. Mm. That means like two minutes early, right? Or five mm. minutes or, mm. early. And I don't care what you wear, whether it's scrubs or a suit or whatever it is, but wear a white coat. Mm. We all need to look professional. Sure, yeah. And that, that like stirred the pot so badly. And I got so much shit for that. And I was like, there was just two simple things, look professional and show up on time. Mm. I like that's just like basic common knowledge, right? Well, that's what I used to tell yeah. my soldiers when I was in the 82nd Airborne. Your only job as a private is to show up on time in the right uniform. Yep. Literally, that is your only job. Yeah. Everything else will fucking just take care of itself. Right. If it's amazing that. that you'd have a, your you know, 18-year-old private yeah. and junior doctors. Yeah, your 28-year-old 28-year-old junior yeah. doctors who yeah. can't do the same thing. Well, it's because nobody's ever made them. Right. Right. Like we all need guardrails in life. Right. I don't ever. And it's, and it's not a, like people think that it's uh, some kind of ego trip or something. It's like, no, this is just the way it's supposed to work. I'm trying to help you. God yep. damn it. Um, and unfortunately there is a natural resistance to being told what to do. And I think that's a good thing because skepticism is important. But when you reinforce that, right. By moralizing the issue and saying, well, they, they, they shouldn't treat you that way. And you tell kids that mm -hmm. man, what the fuck, when did that start? Because yeah. it used to be that when I was growing up, and I, I'm, this isn't like some curmudgeon bullshit. When I was growing up, if another adult told me to do something and I didn't do it, I get the fucking back of the hand, right? Like it's not, and, and I don't, I'm not in favor of hitting people for punishment. I don't think it works. But if you are a parent now and it's another adult corrects your child, the response shouldn't be, don't tell me how to raise my child. It should be high five good looking out because that's the fucking standard. Yep. You know what I mean? And it's got to be the standard from childhood all the way up. It is the standard, the idea that matters, not the individual. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yep. It has to be that way. Uh, unfortunately, we've gotten beyond that, but you know, that's why I like doing this show because now you can all have these conversations and, and discuss this things, these things amongst yourselves and, and maybe disseminate it. 
and you know maybe come up with some better ideas i don't know that's right um, i think spreading awareness and you know having more and pe- more and more people listen to the show from and you know, having people on from all different walks of mm-hmm. life talking about similar things that's yeah. a, that's a thing everybody comes from different walks of life on the show right sure. but they talk about similar issues mm-hmm. all the same issues yeah. um so people from many different angles are seeing the same thing yeah i mean i have you're the second doctor i've had on here second medical doctor um Lots of military people, business people, philosophers, they all say essentially the same shit, Mm -hmm. which is like things are what they are and you've got to face that and you've got to face it in a way that utilizes the tools that you have. And that's pretty much it, man. Yeah. And I think a common common theme amongst all of them, whether they're a PhD or an MD or military or or CEO or whatever it is, they all got to where they got or where where they are Mm -hmm. because of the hard work they put in. Mm -hmm. And didn't really take any handouts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That shit doesn't work. Um, uh, just in the business community, one of the fatal flaws of a lot of companies are to have too much money as a startup because you spend your way out of errors that would have been lessons you would have learned that would have saved you in the future. Yep. You know what I mean? That's a that's a very good point. Yeah. You know, I never thought of that, but yeah, that makes perfect sense. Yeah. Um, we got to get out of here. I got some more shows to do, but tell everybody where they can find you if they're looking to get their face fixed. Uh, <laughs> Hill Country Plastic Surgery here in, well, actually in San Antonio. We're in Austin, mm-hmm. San Antonio, um, down by the medical center. Uh, it was a pleasure speaking with yeah, you Yeah, man, I appreciate you coming today, and I appreciate you all listening. This has been Citizen.